That is a bad show. But it took that was so fun. You are good. You are well. All right. It was it was it was a lot. All right, kids, let's have some order here. Welcome to the Tuesday, January 24 uh, meeting of the Bexley City Council. Uh, Mr. McPeak, how was your week? It's fabulous, sir. How are you? Good. It's good to see good. you looking healthy again here this week. Yeah. All thank right. You. See who's here. All right. All right. Mr. Klingler. Here. Mr. Marcelino. Here. Ms. Saad. Ms. Robinson. Here. Ms. Lamke. Here. Mr. Markham. Here and Miss Feibel. I am here. Oh and I would like to make a motion to make uh, Ms. Saad's um, absence excused. She has second. prepared the way tonight for all her stuff. And that's seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All in favor, same time, sign. Please rise. Join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was clear. Yes. yes. <laughs> Very clear. Oh, it's so much fun to see the place full. I love it. Hey, I think we've got uh, a, a lot of exciting stuff uh, presented to us tonight here. And so let's get underway. Mr. Mayor, we have a candidate for the CIC, I believe. Mr. Simpson, oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, Mike, how's it going? Uh, yeah, Mike Simpson is here as a, uh, a proposed appointee to the Bexley CAC. Mike, if you want to stand up and join us at the dais, just if you could push the button on the microphone, it'll turn on. <laughs> too bad. This is a, have you ever seen like the grueling Supreme Court nominations? It's kind of like that. So just be prepared. So. <laughs> you, you don't have to say anything, but the mic has to be on while you do it. And a lot of people like to say, you can't handle the truth, you know, or something like that. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, sure. what brings you here. Yeah. Um, Mike Simpson. I am uh, 57 years old and uh, work in the commercial real estate brokerage and property management world. Uh, live in Bexley a long time, about 57 years, and uh, used to chair the planning commission and enjoy that contribution to the city. And being in the commercial real estate business, I am always interested in things going on in Main, on Main Street in Bexley and different things going on from an economic development perspective. And I've always told the mayor that if a spot ever came up on the CIC, I'd be interested in participating. Thank you. It's exciting. We're really glad to have you here. We appreciate you uh, putting in this time for the city and everything. Do we have uh, some questions or comments? I just want to augment what Mr. Simpson just said and um, and just say that like over the years, Mike, you've been such a great resource and so helpful. He's uh, If he hears something that's going on in, in, in the real estate world in Bexley, he reaches out, lets us know. Your fingers are the pulse. And uh, I think you would be a fantastic addition to the CIC. So thank you for your continued interest. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Any other comments or questions, Mr. Price? Just a big thank you, Mike. Oh, we're yeah. grateful that you're gonna continue. I mean, sure. you you took a bit of a sabbatical, although I think you, uh, but still took took on any advice you happen to have. But I'm glad that you're back doing something great. So thank you so so very much. You bet. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, sir. Uh, you may sneak out anytime you want. Your attendance has already been noted. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Oh, Rebecca Ness. Good to see you in the house. You want to tell us about mosquitoes? We had so much fun last year. We've been waiting for this. Sure. This doesn't. Okay. Um, hello. So I, I wanted to thank you all for taking the time to listen to uh, the mosquito task, force, mosquito task Force tonight and to hear our preliminary findings for the 2022 Mosquito Pilot Program. I'm Rebecca Ness. I'm the vice chair for Green Bexley. And I'm joined tonight by Dr. Mary Gardner and Dr. Megan Muti. Before we start, I wanted to just take a moment to thank both Dr. Gardner and Dr. Muti for their time, for their work, for their expertise throughout this entire 18 month process. Um, and to thank them for helping Bexley to determine the best strategies for controlling mosquitoes while protecting our beneficial insects. And thank you to the Board of Health for listening and hearing our concerns in the summer of 2021. 
and to Franklin County Public Health for partnering with us throughout the Mosquito Pilot Program. Um, as the grant for the pilot program unfortunately did not come through, the city covered the costs of the traps and some of the various supplies that we needed. The OSU assistants were paid out of other OSU accounts and Dr. Gardner and Dr. Muti both donated their time. Uh, and here's a summary of the process so far. I presented to the Board of Health in July 2021. At that time, a Mosquito Task Force and Franklin County Public Health partnership was formed. The Mosquito Task Force devised the pilot program between August 2021 and February 2022. Between February and May 2022, the treatment groups were formed. This was tricky. <laughs> we needed a total of 100 houses in specific configurations, um, which we'll get into more specifically during the presentation. We required five groups of five houses for each of the four treatment groups. Initially, to help get the word out, we used Green Bexley social media channels, the Bexley newsletter, and the Bexley Blast. I also contacted pretty much everyone I know in Bexley. Um, <laughs> As residents started signing up for the pilot, we created a map to see where treatment groups were forming naturally. Um, and a few complete treatment groups formed on their own, but for the most part, we needed to help the groups form. The maps we created allowed us to see where natural pockets of residents interested in the program were located. And at that point, I called and emailed residents to help them in reaching out to their neighbors, give them some pointers and ideas, in an effort to complete these incomplete groups. Sometimes this worked, but it wasn't working very well. So we came up with a different plan. Um, Paula Krasnoff, another member of the Mosquito Task Force and I, walked and biked to visit the neighbors who live next door or behind residents who had signed up for the pilot in an effort to complete the, these incomplete treatment groups. We informed them about the pilot program and asked that they'd like to join. Um, the large majority of people were interested in being um, a participant. This was very time consuming, but also very effective. It was hard and it was a steep learning curve for me. Um, I learned tons and I'm, I'm glad I did. So in the end, we had 294 households sign up for the pilot program. Of the 294, 105 households participated. And I have a few maps to share with you. This first map here, are, these are all the opt-outs um, Franklin County Public Health opt-outs from summer 2021. These are people who opted out of the spray. So this helped us um, also in pulling together our treatment groups because we knew some people who were not interested in being sprayed. So that helped with some of the treatment one groups. So then this next map, this is, these are our survey responses. These are all the people who wanted to sign up for um, the pilot program. And as you can see, they take up um, all uh, North, Central, and South Bexley. Um, in this next map here, these are the treatment one groups that formed with one in North, two in Central, and two in South Bexley. And then treatment two is the next map. We actually ended up having six treatment groups for treatment two with one in the North, one in the South and four in Central Bexley. This next one is treatment three groups. And the next one, the next map is treatment four. And the last map is all the treatment groups. So throughout the pilot program, I updated all 294 households by email to tell them what was going on at each stage of it. And, um, that's all I have. Thank you. I look forward to hearing the presentation with you and Dr. Muti will talk next. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Dr. Megan Muti. I'm an assistant professor at The Ohio State University and my research focuses on seasonal responses in mosquitoes. And I'm so excited to have had the opportunity to partner with, um, with Rebecca. Um, yeah, can you, you can you pull? Okay, sure. It's a big file. Welcome to our uh, city council, and uh, you know we love 
entomologist here in Bexley. And uh, <laughs> I did my graduate work at Cotman Hall at Ohio State. So worked with Dr. Dave Shetler over there. So, really? yeah, so I'm a plant pathologist. So oh my goodness, I did my undergraduate research, some undergraduate research with Dr. Shetler. So yeah. he's a great guy. <laughs> Okay, cool. So um, Dr. Gardner and I have prepared a short PowerPoint presentation to kind of orient you to the study a little bit more and then share some of the, the key preliminary findings um, that we were able to uncover. So we know why we all hate mosquitoes. They suck our blood and in the process spit into us, which leaves behind itchy bites, but then also adding uh, insult to injury, they can transmit pathogens um, like viruses or plasmodium pathogens or things like that that can make us sick. And here in Ohio, we're most concerned with West Nile virus. Um, so mosquitoes require water for three of their four life stages. So an adult female mosquito will lay her eggs on or near water, as you can see in the picture on the bottom. And then those eggs hatch out into larvae, with, like weird looking little wriggler things. Um, and then they form their pupil stage um, that also move around in the water. And then they emerge as the adults that we know and loathe. Um, and it's only the females that bite. Um, and they do that so that they can acquire enough protein from the blood to lay eggs. So that's what the picture on the top is. And as I mentioned, West Nile virus is what we're most concerned about. Um, in Ohio and throughout most of the US, it's the most um, common mosquito-borne illness. It can cause major die-offs of birds when it was first introduced. We saw large die-offs of crows and blue jays, which is not good. Um, and when mosquitoes can't find birds, they will bite other animals, including humans. Um, and in most, of, most of the time, West Nile virus in humans is just like a summer cold. Um, Flu-like symptoms, you might have a low fever, you might be achy. Um, and, but then sometimes it can be fatal. Um, and 2018 was a particularly bad year for West Nile virus in Ohio, where we had 65 confirmed cases and eight fatalities, unfortunately. Okay, on the next slide. Um, so as you, as a Bexley residents are familiar with current mosquito management. You guys do an amazing job within the city. Um, you remind residents to remove pools of standing water, um, like bird baths, where mosquitoes can breathe. And that's the most effective way of controlling mosquitoes is just to eliminate pools of standing water that are their breathing habitat. Um, and then Franklin County Public Health is a wonderful partner. They go around the city looking at catch basins, places where that can't be drained to see if mosquitoes are breeding there. Um, they also monitor for resistance, a pesticide resistance in mosquitoes. Um, and then throughout the summer, they're collecting mosquitoes from North and South Bexley every single week, identifying those mosquitoes um, to species or at least to genus, and then testing all of the mosquitoes that can transmit West Nile virus to see if West Nile virus is present. And if it is, then they will apply an adulticide, which is the pesticide that can kill adult mosquitoes. So um, as Rebecca mentioned, a good chunk of Bexley residents are currently opting out of Franklin County Public Health's Integrated Mosquito Management Program, meaning that even when West Nile virus is detected in the area, these residents are electing to not have their property sprayed for a number of reasons, mainly concerns about the impact those pesticides might have on beneficial insects. Um, and then in addition, and so this map here shows um, the opt-out map in 2021. So all the red circles are residents who opted to not have their property sprayed. So it's a good chunk of the city. Um, and I shouldn't say 40% of the residents are, that would correct me. It's like 40% of the area. Yes, the residents who opt out account for it and about 40% of reduction in the total possible area that we are able to spray. Because we apply a 100 buffer to each property uh, that she was uh, spraying. So, uh, on a, right, so like 150 feet on either side of the property is not getting sprayed. So 40% total reduction. I'm sorry, I didn't fix that. Okay. Um, and then on the flip side, you have other residents that really hate mosquitoes and really don't want to be bothered by them. So they will pay for commercial pesticide applicators to come to their properties and spray their, their yards um, to control mosquitoes. And these, and these commercial operators come on a calendar basis. So every three weeks or so, they're spraying regardless of whether or not mosquitoes 
are super abundant or whether or not they're infected with a disease. So there's kind of two sides of the same coin going on. Um, next slide. So, um, but with such a large proportion of Bexley residents opting out of mosquito control, this illustrates that there's a wide amount of concern about mosquito management within Bexley. Um, and you guys have decided not to spray when um, levels of mosquitoes are reach a certain threshold. That's what many other municipalities do. So if they detect a high number of nuisance biting mosquitoes, then Franklin County Public Health will spray. Um, but Bexley's not doing that. They're only spraying, you guys are only spraying when West Nile viruses are around. Um, and then according to all the mosquito management people, Franklin County Public Health and the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, spraying adulticides is the least efficient mosquito control technique. It's so much better, like, you know, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? It's so much better and more effective to eliminate pools of standing water. Um, by the time you get to adults flying around and biting you, it's really too late. Um, and 0.1% of the pesticides on average reaches the target pests, which is another reason why spraying adulticides is relatively inefficient. Um, but it's the best way we have of protecting people against West Nile virus. So within Bexley, um, people are really concerned about the impact that pesticides can have on beneficial insects, which include bees and butterflies, which are super important because they pollinate flowers, um, which are critical to ecosystems within Ohio. And if you have gardens, right, you know that your tomatoes start off as flowers, so you need those. You need those flowers to get pollinated to have um, a good crop of tomatoes in your garden. Um, and 85% of flowering plants are rely on power, rely on pollinators. Um, and monarch butterflies are a national insect. And um, there are some studies showing that pesticide spraying um, can jeopardize their health. And then in addition to the bees and butterflies that pollinate flowers, we're also concerned about lace wings and lady beetles and spiders because these will consume insect pests. Um, so the picture on the bottom there shows a ground beetle, I think, right? rabbit, yep, um, going after a mealybug, maybe, a pest, oh, a, a caterpillar, okay, just mound down on it, um, so that's good, <laughs> and then also we, we like beetles and ants because they're really important for recycling nutrients and improving soil health, and again, helping our, our plants to grow, okay, so um, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, she with her concern about beneficial insects and the way that mosquitoes are managed might be impacting beneficial insects. She really spearheaded this effort um, and reached out to first Dr. Gardner, who is an expert, world-renowned expert on, on urban insect ecology and beneficial insects. And then Mary was like, oh, Megan, you know mosquitoes. So she brought me in and I'm so, so grateful. So we formed the task force um, in, last, in July 20th, 2021. Um, and then um, at the Bexley Board of Health meeting, the board voted to move forward and re-examine um, impacts of mosquito management in collaboration with Franklin County Public Health. And then um, the task force was officially formed in August of 2021. And then for the next several months, we met, met, we met monthly to develop a research project. Um, and then we started our study this past summer in 2022. Next slide, please. Okay, so members of the task force really include one, Rebecca, she's our, our hero, um, and as well as Jen Robinson, um, Dr. Rab Robert Shalowitz, uh, Paula Krasnoff, Alex Meyer, Marcy Linegar, me, and Dr. Gardner. Um, and there are her pictures. And the goal of the task force was to determine how we can concurrently protect Bexley residents from mosquitoes without harming beneficial insects. And to really see if we could um, using, use a citywide experiment to examine if we could effectively reduce the number of mosquitoes using mosquito specific traps um, and whether that would be sufficient to remove the need for a pesticide application. And this um, was based on a study that we found published in scientific reports. The title of that article is called Neighbors Help Neighbors Control Urban Mosquitoes. The study was conducted in University Park, um, a suburb of Baltimore, Maryland, where they used one kind of mosquito trap called Gravid 80s traps 
and they found that they were able to successfully reduce the abundance of Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito. So this mosquito is recently invasive to the U.S. and is a very aggressive biter, but does not transmit West Nile virus. Um, and what the authors of this study found is that if they had really high coverage of these specific GAT traps, GAT, gravid AD tr traps, GAT traps, they were able to reduce the number of Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, which made us think we might have some success in Bexley using these traps. Um, but we also, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> oh, no, no, go ahead. Next slide, sorry. Um, so we designed this research project, um, and as Rebecca said, it took heroic efforts and a ton of her time to recruit participants to join the studies and to assign them into these groups of properties. And as she also mentioned, we had four different treatment groups. So the first was a group of uh, residents that were opting out of Franklin County Public Health Mos Mosquito Spraying, um, which as we established was a good chunk of re Bexley residents already. Um, the second treatment, were those who also opted not to have their property sprayed by Franklin County Public Health or hopefully anyone else. Um, and then we put in these special traps to try to control the mosquitoes. The third treatment were those that had their properties sprayed by Franklin County Public Health only when West Nile virus was detected in the area. And then the fourth and final treatment were those that had their property sprayed both by Franklin County Public Health when West Nile virus was in the area and those that had a commercial pesticide company applied barrier spray. Um, and so we had five replicates of each treatment. You might be saying, well, what's a treatment? Well, okay, so the treatments are one, two, three, four, um, but then what's a replicate? A replicate was a group, so next, Advantage, yeah. Um, a replicate was a group of five houses. So those houses could have either been arranged along a road or they could have shared an alleyway. So two houses in the front and three houses in the back with a shared alleyway in between them. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, just to describe the traps a little bit more specifically. So we, we also use the Gravid 80s traps, which are shown in the picture on top there. So they have a black bucket with a clear cylinder on top of that and a smaller um, black cylinder in there. Um, and then there's a sticky card that goes inside of it. And these traps are collecting the 80s mosquitoes, the nuisance spiders that are really aggressive. So the pregnant mamas, the females will fly in there looking for a spot to lay their eggs. And because mosquitoes really only like to fly, um, well, they get trapped in there and they get stuck to the sticky card and they die. Um, we also wanted to develop a trap that would control the Culex mosquitoes, which are the ones that we're most concerned about because they're the ones that transmit West Nile virus. So what we came up with was um, using tubs of water that are tubs that had stinky water in it. They had grass clippings that had fermented for several days in the hot sun and smelled really, really bad. Um, and they also had a pesticide tablet in there. So a, if a Culex female mosquito laid her eggs in there, it would kill the eggs in the developing larvae and the pupae, so they wouldn't be able to complete their life cycle. But the mom mosquito could leave and fly and bite um, and uh, like again, which was obviously not ideal. But that's what we came up with for our traps to control the mosquitoes. And these are present in treatment two. And then as we mentioned, um, treatment three was the Franklin County Public Health Threshold Spray. Um, and that image down there just shows what the, um, what the spray events look like. So um, the sprays are applied using an ultra low volume sprayer that's mounted to a truck that um, moves carefully down the roads. And then the fourth treatment um, where we um, contracted with a local mosquito company who was asked to remain non anonymous um, and they applied a barrier treatment around like the edges of the property once every three weeks. Okay, and so then we wanted to determine whether or not the treatments worked, whether it, there was any change in the number of the mosquitoes across any of these treatments. So in addition to the control traps, we also use two different kinds of surveillance traps. Um, one is called a CDC light trap, and you can see my graduate student Alden Sipperstein setting it up in the picture above. Um, they, there's a little light and a fan um, and a canister of carbon dioxide or of dry ice that gives off carbon dioxide. Mosquitoes 
think that they're finding a blood meal and they'll fly into the trap and get stuck and die. Um, and then we also used um, BG Sentinel traps, which is the image shown on the bottom. Um, so four times throughout the summer, we set up these traps and then collected them 24 hours later and then um, sorted all the mosquitoes that were in there, identified them to species and, and just counted how many there were among the different treatments. And we were sampling specifically from the center house in each of those replicates. Okay. Um, in addition to that, we also collected the sticky cards that were inside of the Gravid 80s traps within those, all of the properties that were in treatment too that had those mosquito control traps in their yards. Um, and we found that, let's see, <laughs> there's me and Paul setting them up on the picture on top. And then on the, the picture on the bottom is my research technician, Hannah, who is the one who actually went out and collected the sticky cards and identified all the mosquitoes to species, um, which is not an easy feat. And then we found that a total of 906 mosquitoes were collected in those Gravid 80s traps um, during the study season. So they were out from June 15th through September 16th. And most of the mosquitoes that we collected in them were the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, that nuisance spider. The highest catch in any yard within a two-week period was 32 mosquitoes. So um, a decent number of mosquitoes were being eliminated, but there's a lot of Aedes mosquitoes around. Um, and in addition to those traps, we also collected over 3,600, 3,600 non-mosquitoes, which were mainly small gnats and midges, and things that aren't really playing much of a role in pollination or are predatory. So um, just something to know. Okay, and then in terms of our preliminary results with the total mosquitoes, let me walk you through these graphs and I apologize for their complexity. So on the y-axis, we have the total number of mosquitoes. On the x-axis, we have the date. Um, and each of those circles represents um, a replicate. So the center house from um, one of those treatments. Um, and then the different colors indicate that replicate changing over time. Um, and this is the first treatment that the first treatment that I'm showing you here are those that opted into Franklin County Public Health Integrated Mosquito Management Program. Um, and what you can see is that the number of mosquitoes within a yard changes over time. Um, not super surprising. The black dashed lines are indicating when Franklin County Public Health detected West Nile virus and needed to spray during the during the study period. Um, but overall, mosquito levels were pretty pretty low in most people in most yards throughout the season. Um, the second graph here is oriented the same way, but now we're looking at the data from the yards that were opting into Franklin County Public Health Spray, as well as having the commercial company spray uh, every three weeks. So the addition of the red dash lines indicates um, when that mosquito company was applying their pesticides. And again, mosquitoes are changing within yards over time, but overall we can see that they're the total number of those mosquitoes is pretty low. Um, and when we do statistics on the data, um, what we find, if you advance on the next slide, is that actually there is no statistically significant difference in the number of mosquitoes between the Franklin County Public Health opt-in and adding the commercial spray. So even though there are fewer mosquitoes, when you added the spray, it wasn't a significant, statistically significant difference. However, when people opted out of the spray, um, the total number of mosquitoes was significantly higher than both of those other two treatments. And when we add uh, the last graph showing there um, is the trap is the treatment that had the mosquito specific traps. So um, the addition of the traps also did not um, significantly reduce the number of mosquitoes. Those, those yards had more mosquitoes than the yards that opted into Franklin County Public Health Management, um, either with the spray or without. And now you get to hear from Dr. Mary. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. Uh, so my role in this was to look at the beneficial insects and how they responded to the different treatments. And so we chose to focus on two really important groups that are found in urban landscapes. One being pollinators, which are the focus of the Love Your Alley program here in Bexley, um, and also lady beetles. Lady beetles are important because they're predators of many agricultural and garden pests. 
They're also a major conservation concern because we've lost many native species of lady beetles and others are threatened and endangered. And so activities to promote their abundance, they um, respond to many of the same garden features as bees. And so we wanted to look at both of these groups. Uh, they're both pretty easy to sample. So that uh, made our life a little bit easier. To look at the bee abundance, we use small pan traps that are painted bright yellow, um, white, and uh, like a neon blue. And to a bee's eyes, those are looking like floral cues. And so they're falling into those pans. And you can see a sample from one of the front yards there in the foreground to measure lady beetle activity and also total insect, flying insect activity. We used yellow sticky card traps. It's a similar thing. The yellow card actually uh, to a lady beetle looks like a plant that's been damaged by aphids. The lady beetles go to the card and they get stuck on the card. So like Megan, we went out uh, uh, once a month, put out these traps, the pan traps stayed for a day and the sticky cards stayed for a week and then we collected them. So right now, uh, the beneficial insects data is, uh, does take a long time to process. Uh, it is the focus of an undergraduate research project. And so he's in the process of pinning all of the bees that we collected from front yards. To identify bees, you have to wash dry with a hand blow dryer and pin each individual identify them, then fly them to DC to have them verified. So it's quite a process. Uh, so he, uh, this student uh, is doing an excellent job at this. Uh, we're targeting early April to complete the bee identification uh, because we're going to take him to a, a conference to present this. And hopefully he could also come back to speak to a group here and present his findings if that's a possibility. So tonight what I'm gonna show you is the lady beetle and sticky card results. So my graphs are a little bit different because I pooled by month. So what we're looking at here, uh, this is the total number of insects per yellow sticky card trap in June, July, and August. And then the treatments are the different lines. So you see all four treatments on this figure. So recall treatment one was uh, the kind of no control, no Franklin County Public Health, no traps. Treatment two had the traps. The orange line is the Franklin County Health sprays when West Nile was detected. And then the red is the Franklin County Public Health plus the barrier spray. So what you see here, um, like me in Megan's graph, there's variability by month. We do see uh, a slight reduction in total insect abundance in July uh, versus uh, the treatment one where there was no control, but by August, the, there is no significant difference. The insect abundance is similar in all the treatments. And then also here for the lady beetles, uh, the first thing I want to point out is that I've spent a long time collecting lady beetles, 17 years or something like that, which is like a crazy thing to do with your life, but I enjoy it. And, um, Overall, they were very in very low abundance in, in Bexley. Um, and I don't know exactly why that is, um, but we'll talk a little bit about some uh, activities that we might do to increase the abundance of beneficial insects kind of at the end. But what we did find was that there was no significant difference among the treatment one, which had no sprays, and the two treatments that had some level of sprays. Although recall from Megan's, the first Franklin County Public Health spray didn't happen until early August. So really you're just seeing variability there. Um, we did see fewer lady beetles in the trap treatment. That's not because the lady beetles fell in the trap. I think it's actually because the people who had the yards with the traps were also the people who had abundant floral resources, gardens, vegetable gardens, a lot of habitat. Sometimes when you have variation in habitat quality among sites, your trap capture rates can be affected because a bright yellow card in the middle of turf is a lot more apparent than a bright yellow card in a sea of flowers. So my prediction here is that the trap maybe just was not as effective. I don't think those folks negatively impacted the beetles. So Megan, do you want me to go through your mosquito? Okay. So um, what we found here was the mosquito specific traps failed to reduce the total mosquito abundance. But as they just mentioned, this could also be because the landscapes, the people who don't want sprays are the people who love to garden. They are concerned about pollinators. They have all these flowers. They have very complex landscapes and we only put four total traps. 
And we predict following this, that those traps were not enough to maybe overcome the amount of mosquitoes that were in those yards. So that's one thing we need to think about for future research. Uh, and that's kind of shown here in this variability where um, those that opted into Franklin County Public Health with just some small numbers of sprays did have fewer mosquitoes, but when we had the traps, they just weren't performing as well, unfortunately. The starting point, yeah, the starting points on the graph with the traps is higher. So. And people who opted into the sprays typically had a front yard lacking floral resources with mostly turf grass, and that's going to be a lower mosquito environment. So that's a challenge as a field biologist. You know, you want, if, if any of you are in medical research or life sciences, you're like, your experiment was flawed. Yes, we know. <laughs> but every experiment in the field is always flawed to some extent because you're working with communities and with a ton of variability. So what we can say here is, there was variability to start. We, will not, we were not able to overcome it with the current trapping technology. However, there are other options that we can discuss. And if we can go to the next slide. Uh, Franklin County's integrated mosquito management program did significantly reduce uh, mosquito abundance. It did not impact non-mosquito abundance in either of the traps. And it also did not have a negative effect on the beneficial insects thus far that I've studied. So that's a very positive outcome. Um, adding the barrier treatments to the properties did not significantly reduce mosquito uh, abundance beyond what Franklin County Public Health was doing. So I guess if people are paying for this, they may not be getting what they are paying for, at least in our findings. Uh, this did significantly reduce the abundance of non-mosquitoes in light traps. So Megan did pick up that, hey, these additional sprays may be negatively affect affecting other insects, but we didn't see a signal of it necessarily in my data. Now, another thing with only sampling in the city of Bexley, you have 40% of the area not sprayed. So when you're collecting insects, even if there is mortality very locally, if only 40% of the area, well, if 40% of the area is not sprayed, there's a lot of unsprayed habitat to serve as a refuge, which is really good um, if you don't wanna have a large impact on your insect population. It also makes it hard to really measure the effect of spraying because um, we can't, unless we put little cages out, we can't necessarily see the, the target effect. And by after a week, things are able to recolonize. So that's very good uh, in this area, but you might've found something different if there was no one opting out and the spray was taken across a large area. So the next slide. Uh, so I think I've said most of this, but just a word of caution, uh, these insects are good dispersers. So they're able to recolonize. We have a lot more to process, including our, our bee data, which I hope to be able to present soon. And another thing that traps do not indicate is if you see an insect walking along, you don't know if it's about to die or if it's really healthy and about to reproduce. And so when you capture something, it's just a count. But what we really want to know with these rare and threatened insects is how well are they doing? Are they reproducing? How long are they living? Are they surviving the winter? Things can be weakened by exposures to pesticides and lack of food. And that's another really important thing to measure. Next slide. So what are we doing next? So we're gonna finish processing all of our data, uh, produce a final report that will be provided to the city council. Megan has also done a ton of work with Rebecca to put together a survey uh, to get the feedback from the residents. I did a lot of the trap uh, upkeep in the summer and people, um, there's a few things that are awkward. If we're going to have traps in people's backyards as, and somebody would be coming to replace the water, we would need them, for instance, to bring them out and put them on the sidewalk like you would a refuse container. Because going into people's backyards is problematic for a number of reasons of dogs, frightening people, et cetera. Some people also had complaints about the smell of the traps. So those are some of the things we've heard, but we'll get the total um, feedback from the survey. 
Another really exciting thing, we went ahead and put uh, took our preliminary data and put in for a USDA grant in August. Uh, we got support from the city here and also from Green Braxley and other groups, Franklin County Public Health, and we were funded for 750 grand to continue this project. So the project can really take off. Now there's a catch though with the federal government because there is no federal budget until there is a final federal budget. USDA will not release their budget, and so they will not release our funds. So we are very hopeful that we will get this money in time to start this summer. Uh, if we do, we will be expanding the project to include four neighborhoods or cities, including Grandview, uh, Upper Arlington, and the neighborhood of Clintonville and Columbus, along with Bexley, uh, so that we have more variability uh, in the number of households opting out, and we're able to spread out the treatment groups more across the city. So we will continue to look at different types of traps and expand our beneficial health, uh, beneficial insect health outcomes with this project. And we're happy to provide, you know, more details on that project if you would like. And we just want to thank everyone um, because without of all your support, we wouldn't have been able to get this information and be able to move forward um, with the project. We want to thank everybody on our task force, all of the people who let us collect insects with all kinds of traps from their landscape. Some of you are here, so you know what that was like. Uh, we want to thank the mayor's office for their generous support. Um, of our study, providing traps, materials, paying for the spray applications for one of our treatments. It was a huge, um, could not have done it without that help. Uh, it's been amazing working with the Franklin County Public Health folks, and they're here uh, as well tonight to answer questions. Uh, we coordinated sprays. We They provided us with stinky water when our container blew up. Um, they let us store our field materials in their location. They were uh, provided maps. They were incredible. And obviously, um, Megan and I get to work with some amazing young people who collected and processed all this stuff. Um, so with that, I think we're done and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Mr. Marcelino. Thank you very much. Uh, so my position is the uh, health and safety chair here for city council. I uh, stepped in after Jen started this with the group. Um, as I'm seeing through the results here, it seems like there's really not much of a change um, here, but it, it, you know, in terms of Franklin County, um, as long as they opt into it, but it doesn't seem like there's much of a change when they get the private company to come out and spray. So would it be your recommendation per the initial results in the study to consider outlawing that spray since it has a negative impact upon beneficial bugs? Well, Sorry for lack of biological terminology. That's, I think, a big step um, that I would want to test a little bit, at least with a second year before I would put stamp my name on that recommendation, just personally one year. Uh, it does appear, I mean, as a, as a citizen of Columbus, if I saw those data, I would probably decide not to spend the money to spray my own yard just as an individual. But as a scientist, we know that, you know, year to year, mosquito populations can vary. Weather patterns can vary. Um, the number of sprays that Franklin County Public Health might need to do could vary, and that could affect the success of or the effectiveness of the barrier spray. So because of those reasons, I would want to do one more year of testing, which we should be able to do so long as we get this USDA funding. Um, with that in hand, then I think we could definitely, we would be able to make a decision. Okay. Yeah. You. And I don't know if you guys feel differently about that, but okay. Mr. President, I have a quick. Sure. Yep. I just wanted to, um, first off, thank you so much for all the work you guys have put into this and the time, clearly a ton of work. I have a just super quick follow-up question. Going to the slide, you guys said a couple times that there didn't seem to be a big, or sorry, that the opt-in for FCPH top left chart was more effective than the opt out. But when I, and I, I'm just looking at those numbers and it feels to me like, yeah, not much of a difference, which from a public policy perspective is like, why would we spray if those are the results that were at lack, I would say lack of results. So I wanted to just clarify that statement because I heard a couple of times that the opt-in was that much more effective than the opt out. But I look at those numbers and it seems like they're all over the place, frankly. And, and maybe it's not a large enough study, but I'm just curious if you have any comments on that. Megan, do you? Because I agree. I don't 
the yeah so anyways um so sometimes you can uncover things that are statistically significant that may not be biologically significant right so the data are super noisy this test that i used here was a two-way repeated measures analysis of variance um, to try to account for the fact that we were going into the same yards over and over again. And so the number of mosquitoes in the past might be influencing the number of mosquitoes in the future. Um, I don't remember how significant those results were, like what exactly the p-value is for those of you who are familiar with statistics. I would imagine it's not super tiny. So the more tiny the p-value, the more strong the, like the more statistically significant that result is. I would imagine that it's probably a fairly large p-value. Um, and it does seem that like towards the end of the season, certainly one of the, yeah, mosquito populations are going up um, despite what Franklin County Public Health is doing. On some of the bonus secret slides, I, I went through and I also looked at on a more granular level, um, what are you know what are the eighties mosquitoes nuisance spiders doing versus what are the Culex mosquitoes doing the ones that transmit West Nile virus, um, and it does seem that the Franklin County Public Health opt in in those cases are probably a little bit better at reducing the number of the nuisance biting mos or sorry the the Culex mosquitoes than the other mosquitoes that don't transmit disease, so. But agreed, like I wouldn't make any kind of public policy decisions based on this one year of data, given um, the fact that this is, you know, we we did we did our best. <laughs> um, I think we uncovered some really cool and interesting things. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot more work that we have to do. Thank you. And I, and I also want to acknowledge Dr. Beth Whitted from our Board of Health is here with us and Kathleen Gravel also from our Board of Health. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. And I was I was so happy to be a part of this study. One of the great things about it is that they were rifling through my backyard. They found some confidential documents in the, in the tool shed, so I was able to get those to the uh, special, counsel. special counsel. And so that's that's good too. So well, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's all I have. Do, uh, I have a couple of questions. So uh, is your design and study based on uh, some existing research that uh, it has shown significant uh, results? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about what's been done out there and what, what's been seen? So Megan had a, had a picture of the publication, if anybody wants to look it up. So the, we got the idea to do this after Rebecca contacted us because in Baltimore area, some folks had done a trap out successfully of 80s mosquitoes, the nuisance biting. And they put a high density of these 80s traps in people's yards and were able to successfully reduce 80s mosquitoes. Now, because it's Culex that triggers your spray controls, right? Because those are the West Nile virus mosquitoes. We wanted to build on what they did by also trying to control Culex. And nobody had done that before. So that was the novel part of what we were doing that we didn't know how it would work. Now, as Megan said, there's a lot of variability. One thing that we talked about after the project was over that we think, especially for one thing, in the Baltimore study, it was very small yards. If, you know, if you've been to certain cities where they have, you know, the really narrow houses and people are live pretty close together, the yards are a lot smaller. So the density of green compared to buildings in that area was a lot smaller than here. So when we got here and saw how big the yards were, we quickly thought we probably don't have enough traps, but it's a pilot study. We have a very limited budget. We're going to go with what we have. If we were going to institute this, I think we would need more traps to deal with the larger yards. Also, we talked about potentially designing a Culex trap that would not only have the stinky water to collect the larvae, but would have some sort of netting that would trap the females. Mm. And it would have a fan that kind of sucked them in. There is a commercial trap like that that we could purchase with our larger grant and test. You would need less density of those because they collect several hundred, right, Megan, mosquitoes per trap. Um, so we're really excited to test out that trap and see if it's more effective because I think you know, the Baltimore study was a great place to start in science. You always want to build off what someone else has done, right? So we, you know, we took their information and implemented it, but this is a much different landscape. 
and we have to modify what we're doing um, to meet the needs of the people here. So I think a higher trap density is going to have to be part of it. But you can't put stinky traps all over someone's yard. So I do think that this vacuum trap and having fewer, that might work with people. I don't think people would accept more of the stinky traps in their yard because we had some pushback, even when people opted in, when we showed up with it, you know, they had second thoughts. And so will you be uh, testing out those sort of design modifications with the second round then? Is that what you anticipate? Yeah, with the, with the grant funding, we're going to be purchasing some of these other traps and testing that out. We'll also be testing the different treatments in multiple cities. So in Grandview, for instance, there's a very low concentration of people opting out of the spray program. So we need to test the effectiveness of the spray program of the barrier sprays in landscapes that vary in pesticide concentration. Here you have quite a few people opting out, 40%. In Grandview, they have like 5%-ish, very low. Um, it's far fewer. Mm. Uh, Clintonville, similar to here. Mm. Uh, Upper Arlington, more similar to Grandview. So we have kind of two communities with very low opt-out rates, two communities with more high opt-out rates. So we can compare that um, effectiveness of the surrounding area, which is really important too. That's interesting because the Culex is what triggers the sprays, but the 80s, of course, is what we notice. Yeah, yes. that's what aggravates us. So you've got to have both because if you if you kill the Culex, but people are getting bit, they're going to call Megan and I and say, <laughs> you know, right. we want so we've got to figure out really good. And I don't know if you thought the 80s trap needed modification too. I feel like we could work on some. Yeah, I um, I was underwhelmed with the 80s trap. Um, and maybe having a higher density of them would help. But yeah. People liked the 80s trap because it looked more professional. Yeah. yeah. So one thing that we ran into that we did not anticipate was that the the gravid trap was a bin with water. It's very simple. We thought, you know, it's low profile, kind of be in the grass, no one will notice. But they actually preferred the bucket trap, I think because it looked like a trap. So that's another thing to think about with this kind of thing that it seemed like a lot of the public liked it to look more scientific, like they were doing something. Not like they just threw something in their yard and forgot about it, which is an important thing to think about when you're designing something in someone's front yard. So a practical question for people, uh, residents like myself, who have a couple dogs in the backyard, are there concerns about having dogs or animals roaming around with those traps? And do you take any modification on that? Yeah, so we, tr we ask people to not let their dogs in the backyard, or, or if they did have those traps, to put them up uh -huh. higher, like on a deck or on a shelf where the dogs couldn't get them. Um, so the gravid water, it just smells wretched. Um, it's, it's, there are no words to describe how bad this We smelled smells. like that water all summer. Oh, yeah. yeah. My dogs love that smell. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not secret to them, but it's, it's not it's problematic. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. then if they drink all the water, then they're not going to be attractive to the mosquitoes anymore. We And we also did have a pesticide tablet in there, um, but it was derived from bacteria and it's only harmful for insects. So like yeah. mammals, like okay. your dog, we could drink that water and it would be the bacteria from the gross stinky grass clippings not the not the pesticide that would be problematic to our health so that'd be a totally different experiment really wouldn't it <laughs> <laughs> potential issue if this was going to go big scale is that people we would put the trap where we thought it could collect a lot of mosquitoes but then people would not like the placement and they would move it into the sun or in an, right. in an area where it probably didn't collect any mosquitoes. Uh, so there's some level of loss of traps that you deal with. And so I think uh, a public awareness campaign with the launch of something like this um, would be part of our larger budget moving forward so that people would really understand more the why. I mean, I, I think people are excited. They were very cooperative. They tried, but... There's a lot of moving parts with this. And, you know, even though we had sheets explaining all of that, people are busy. They don't maybe read all that stuff. So we had a few issues with that too. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thank you for doing this here. And it, you said that you will have the data in April. And so when can we expect you back maybe to tell us about that data? 
do you meet every month, like in the summer? We meet every other week, except in July. We do take July off. So let's plan on a June time frame or May time frame for that. Perfect. Yeah. Like springtime, we'll talk about mosquitoes. You guys, you guys have, you guys have priority scheduling here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we have reached the point for public comments. Any speaker slips? No speaker slips. All right, president's report. The only thing I have for the president's report is I did receive the notice. Actually, I think Mark received this, the Ohio Ethics Commission filing reminder, financial disclosure statements for you guys, uh, Monday, May 15th. So that's a little bit away, but uh, don't forget that that will be coming up. And... Time for city attorney report. Don't forget your um, disclosure statements. No report. Yes. How about auditor? Uh, no report. Well, I'll bet you Mayor Kessler has some reports. Um, yes, Mr. President. Although I would, I would say if you want to skip to the ordinances with visiting presenters, I'd be happy to cede the floor so that our commission members who are here tonight uh, let's do, not do have to that. They, through my yeah. I see Lengthy some. update, although they may, of course. Does that work? Yeah, that works for me. Do uh, you want to skip to number 10? And Mr. Fischel, do you read that for us? Uh, ready. All right. So we have, uh, is this the third reading? Third reading? It is yeah, third reading of ordinance 49-22 to adopt residential design guidelines that was introduced by Mr. Klingler. Thanks, Mr. Fischel. Thanks, President Markham. I believe we have is Karen. Karen Boker is going to speak uh, on behalf of the ARB on all their hard work on this. Yes, thank you. Do you have my slideshow ready to go? Slideshow. Right I only have now. eight slides. So. Oh, you know what? Sorry. <laughs> One moment. Um, I was looking in the wrong folder. I see it. So while there we go, that was quick. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present this to you. We're going to do a very short presentation and have a little interactive conversation of which at which time I think I have a couple board members and participants um, in this project, which is really a labor of love that we've been working on for, I bet, four or five years at this point. Uh, COVID certainly slowed it way down. As all of you probably know, Architecture Review Board has been swamped through um, the, the pandemic. So it um, slowed us down quite a bit. But I just wanna talk a little bit about um, this project. Can you go back one slide? Yep. Um, I also wanna point out before I start how incredibly lucky Kathy and I are to have this board, this Architecture Review Board. Um, just about everybody came tonight. I didn't tell them they had to, they didn't, didn't twist any arms. They just are really, um, are, are here because this is really part of it. I just wanted to recognize the board members. If you could just stand for a second, Joanne Strausser, our chairman, Suzanne Tony, Larry Hellman, Bill Heyer, Jocelyn. Did I miss anybody? Brosky. Um, I just wanted to do that before I forget when I get into this, because that is a board that has spent an unbelievable amount of time on their own reviewing this document time after time um, and giving me comments back. It's been an, an interactive process. Um, the Board of Zoning and Planning, I also wanna recognize in the Bexley Historical Preservation Committee, which has been a little bit inactive. We'll talk a bit about that, but um, that really was the, the start of uh, the whole project. Um, I also wanted to thank Matt and actually Jess Saad also who started with us on this. And of course, um, my fellow staff members, Mayor Ben, Kathy, and Jason. Okay, that's it. That's enough for the appreciation and recognition. I just wanted to tell my job for you tonight is not to go into the 189 page document. No way I'm taking it for what it's worth that you've thumbed through it and you get the idea. What I really want to um, make clear is why we need this done and why we need it to be um, approved and blessed by all of you so that we can get it up and running on our website so that we can help our residents, designers um, do better job 
to help them better with design, with renovations, projects, et cetera. So this, what you see up there right now is literally the design guidelines and standards, the entire thing that we've been using since 2000. It's five pages. It's very narrow in scope. It just des describes, you know, you should match materials. You should, it's very, there's no illustrations. It doesn't have any context in it doesn't talk about the neighborhoods of Bexley, the characteristics of Bexley homes, the type of styles, designs, et cetera, none of that, nor does it have context about how our process works, which is confusing. It can be very confusing. Um, next slide. Fast forward to now, 23 years later, um, this is what we're proposing to you. Uh, new design guidelines and standards. They're, it's gonna be very modern, broad in scope, um, it's a living document, which means that we will be asking as part of this blessing approval that we have the ability to change it and um, grow and add to it as things change um, and add to it. There's, there's a never ending vocabulary of architecture um, and details that we constantly, we could go on forever and we would like the ability to do that. Um, by a living document, we also mean that we want it up and running on our website so that it's it's um, immediately when this passes here, we'd like to um, post the PDF, but then I'm going to be working with Sam and uh, Metcalf to make it interactive so that you can click on something and it'll take you to the ordinance that, you know, is, is for example, the solar panels, which I have a slide in here to, to illustrate that. Um, we also have a very large section, as I'm sure you've seen, that talks about the existing neighborhood characteristics that I think is, is really important, and a lot of effort went into it. Um, it seemed to really blur the lines on our, preservation, our historic preservation committee, and we've learned rightly so, because when you um, go to do a new build, a renovation, even just changing a window or a door, it's really helpful to understand the context of the neighborhood that you're in. There's some neighborhoods have more front porches and some neighborhoods have less. And um, I think Mr. Heyer is going to talk for a little bit about that. And also Mr. Hellman. This is also illustrated. If you remember the first slide I showed, this third slide I showed you with only three, five pages, there's not a single illustration in there, which is so odd for anything that a designer would want to follow or, or create. So it's heavily illustrated. I'm going to show you some um, sample pages. The responsibilities and process here in the city, what committees or boards and um, staff are responsible for what and where a resident or a builder or an architect or designer should go to find out how to accomplish what they want to accomplish. That's all going to be in here and click and point and lead you to the forms and documents that, that you, you'll need to accomplish a project. And we also have lots and lots of design and planning examples. Um, next slide. Uh, just really quickly, I want to sum it up in in about 30 seconds for you, what we had meeting after meeting on, how do we define the difference between standards and guidelines? And, you know, you have, I've been in many, many rooms that that discussion has occurred, but we just set it out very simply. The standards are the widely applicable principles and considerations, and the guidelines are how to get there. Um, so that's just a slide I thought was a page in the beginning that I thought was pretty important just to put out there. Next slide. So I just want to run really quickly through just some sample pages. I'm not going to read them. I just want to show them. This is the kind of example of process charts that we have created. Jason Sudi and Kathy Rose um, helped me with this. Next slide. So we do have process flow charts. Uh, the Bexley neighborhood map, which talks about the different kinds of neighborhoods. Um, Larry Hellman created this and Bill Heyer took it to the next level with breaking down examples in each one. Next slide. This is an example of the, the narrative, including um, streetscapes and photographs of different neighborhoods. Next slide. And you can see how all, we have illustrations. And they're amazing illustrations, thanks to Bill Heyer and his um, firm. And I, I'm going to let him say a few things in a minute about these. I, I, he, it's The illustrations speak for themselves. They're just beautiful. And I've used samples of these already to get residents and architects through the process. And they are, they are really working. 
Next slide. We also have simple detail samples of how to do things right and how to do things wrong. And um, this has just changed, changed my world because I, instead of sketching out every single time, I can go right to these pages, even in the rough draft, and it, people get it like that when they see the illustrations. Next. These are some other examples of how to do windows right, how to do porch details right. Um, I am already using these every single day. Just had somebody yesterday call to didn't understand what we meant by matching grids on windows. Pulled up this page and you can just see clearly, like, do your windows have the six over, you know, three over two or six over whatever it is that helps residents who aren't used to, to hearing architectural language understand it immediately. Next slide. I wanted to throw in there an example of the, the living document kind of thing. This is, as you are well aware of this, the solar ordinance that you all just um, passed. We're very happy about that, that you listened to a lot of our comments at the Architectural Review Board and Board of Zoning and Planning. Um, this isn't even updated yet. And you can see, so the next thing I will be doing is going through, and I think that um, Connie rightly pointed out that we that you had changed uh, six foot to ten foot. It doesn't matter, but that's what we mean about living document. So we will just be able to update it readily as ordinances are, are updated or changed. Um, next, so what are the next steps? We would like you to approve this and bless it, and we want to get it out there. We want to have open forums take it to the Bexley Board of Realtors, to our architects and designers, to our contractors. We wanna put it live on our website and, and then work to put links to all the other documents um, and sites that are important. And we just wanna continually update and expand as, as we grow. Any questions on my part? I tried to be as short and succinct as I possibly could. I could go on for 189 Mr. pages of it. <laughs> Mr. Klingler. Not, not so much a question, but I commend you and all of you on this. It, a lot of labor and love was was poured into this. One thing I, I will say as a former contractor, um, if we could get the flow chart on the viewpoint site when you go to register for a permit, that will help. I think immensely homeowners, contractors that don't understand the process, you go get ready to try to start a project and you say, oh, wait, I got to go in front of VSAP. I got to go. So just that flow chart um, catches people attention. And um, I think it'd be good to have as soon as you go to apply for a permit. Yeah. And I think that's a great, that, that is kind of what's, what's in our heads, yeah. not just to go from this document to, to the process, but have a, have a link on the contractor's webpage that will take you then to this. So it's going to be a lot of work going, creating all those links, but I think that's going to be invaluable to residents, contractors, realtors, anybody in the building industry. Um, I, I think I probably have a couple board members that would like to, yeah. uh, to speak. Um, bring them up, bring up your best. Chart real quick. Um, I guess first thing I would say, Bexley is an architectural treasure. And we all get to share that treasure each and every day. And it's a joy to work on this uh, and to participate in something that has such meaning and value for the community. Uh, and I'll do two minutes here, two and a half. Um, you know, 1910 to 1930 was a vibrant time, rich time in residential architecture. You had Tudor came out and, and you had Dutch Colonial and a Cotswold cabinet. It was just a wonderful time. And that coincided uh, with post-war 20s boom uh, to where young couples wanted to leave the city or leave apartments and, and get a house and get a yard and a garage and a backyard for a garden. Uh, and they came in the hundreds. They came basically, oh, no, I'm sorry, Ben, the, uh, the neighborhood chart. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, it, and so that really, created the, the movement that established this place up the hill. And just quickly from a historical standpoint, uh, the, the initial big development, of course, was Bullet Park, that's 200, 300 acres. And that was a, del a delivery system to where you bought a lot, you hired an architect, you did a builder, big estate lots, and it kind of set the tone for the community. Uh, eventually, of course, you run out of rich people, and so you've got to just do regular housing. And so as things move from east 
to our west to east, uh, both uh, South Bexley, Central and North, um, you ended up with the developer builder who then uh, uh, bought lots, copied some of the designs and carried them forth on these houses, on these regular houses. Uh, and, and people loved it because you could, you could, you could elect your lifestyle uh, with your house. Um, and then at 1930s and the depression, everything kind of came to a stop. And so everything by then had pretty much been platted out, um, but there were a lot of vacant lots. And so most of the vacant lots were further east, some were integrated in. And so you've seen a different kind of housing that got developed then in the 40s and the 50s, the smaller two stories and Cape Cods. Uh, and then to the far east, uh, by that time, uh, people were a little less interested in detached garages and they wanted ranch houses. And so, of course, we have our section of ranch houses. And I say that just simply because the richness of the architecture. And then I'll end with uh, just two thoughts. One, uh, different extremes, and there are especially uh, special focus areas throughout our community. One, obviously, is sessions. And that whole area is like a little housing laboratory. You've got uh, you've got the the French Normandy of, of, of Sessions Village, which is just renowned. Uh, you've got the other condo projects. You've got four Frank Lloyd Wright houses. Uh, you've got the Tudors off broad. Wonderful, wonderful setting. And then the, the, the quiz question for the day uh, would be, and you can use this at your, uh, your next uh, party, um, where is the greatest concentration of stone houses in Bexley? Uh, and few people would, would, uh, uh, would get this outright. It's on North Merkel. Uh, when, when the, when at that point of development we were doing Cape Cods and smaller houses, some builder decided my Cape Cods will sell better than your Cape Cods if they're stone. And so there's 32 stone-faced. And and so the point of all that is that kind of neighborhood understanding feeds into the way you look at how to protect and enhance and make sure these neighborhoods stay viable. Uh, and we've done it for a hundred years. We're hoping to do it for another hundred. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elman. Mr. Mayor, members of city council, I just have a couple things to say. I've been involved um, with um, the design guidelines in ARB and BZA before that. Uh, I'm Bill Heyer. Um, I've had my practice and I've lived in Bexley for 21 years now. And in this process, as an architect, I learned so much about the character of Bexley. Uh, and I think a lot of our board members and Karen and Kathy, and there's a lot that we discovered along the way. And I say that because so many residents come to our board and are interested in understanding the character of their neighborhood. They're interested in our viewpoint on that. Uh, and what is Bexley and what is this, what is this character? Um, so putting together these um, design guidelines, it was really a learning experience for everyone. Um, also just being able to recognize how diverse the architecture is in Bexley, which led us to really understand that these guidelines are unique. Um, we looked at other design guidelines from other municipalities, and there are a couple of things that are characteristic of these guidelines that are very different from other municipalities. One is there is no timestamp on the design guidelines. This covers everything from modern design, contemporary uh, uh, additions to historic styles. Uh, unlike some other historic districts in, in near downtown that have a timestamp or another um, city municipality uh, about 15 miles northeast of us that has a um, sort of applied timestamp, right? Bexley is, is a, a city that has a diverse um, growing and ever-changing architecture. And so the design guidelines really had to respond to that. Um, so that's that's um, really what we started with, and I'm really excited for um, these design guidelines to really help all the residents of Bexley to appreciate not only their own house more, but also their neighborhood in particular with all these names, uh, these historic names for, for the different districts, understanding how their neighborhood is, is different from other 
uh, neighborhoods where porches are, like uh, Karen was mentioning, where they're not uh, predominant. But again, leaving this open for um, developments in architectural design. And that's the challenge, is not trying to just close it down. We, we want this to be a living document that continually is updated for those and ref, refinements and changes over time. I'd also like to recognize two uh, people from my office, Reed Thompson and Sarah Abelos, who were instrumental in putting together the images that you are seeing here and that will be throughout the document. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, do we have any uh, comments or questions? Yes, Ms. Robinson. Just a quick comment. I have to say, I am not an architect. So to uh, approach this document as a complete lay person um, who would love to do lots to her house, <laughs> much to my husband's chagrin, um, I thank you so much for all of this. It, it's it's easy to understand. Um, not always easy to read, but uh, if you are looking for specific information, it's there. And, um, you know, as, as just a regular resident of Bexley, I can tell you that a lot of people will really appreciate this. So thank you so much for your time on this. It really is also just the night and day, like you say, to integrate the drawings and the graphics versus just that plain text. Like you feel like you're more of a lawyer than anything to have to kind of sort through that. So it's, it really looks fantastic. Uh, at this time, I'll open up to uh, comments since this is the third reading from the audience, if anybody has uh, anything to say. If not, do you have a comment? Would I ever not have a comment, Mr. President? I'm just no. I, I just wanted to thank Karen and all the hard work you put into this. Karen organizing all this and Kathy and I think um, Connie as part of our historic preservation committee. So I think I was sitting here listening, and, and Karen mentioned it a little bit at the beginning. But we started a historic preservation committee right before the pandemic hit, a bit before the pandemic hit. And as we worked through it, I think we realized that we were really lacking in standards in order to then start to develop a more coherent and holistic historic preservation policy and law. And so this was actually step one. So council, you're kind of on notice that step two is that long term ambition to start to more um, comprehensively look at historic preservation, especially commercial property, because we don't have any protections for commercial property and a more holistic uh, protection for uh, residential property that does not only apply to teardowns. So that's hopefully like how this then evolves as we move forward. So really great work. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Excellent. Mr. Klingler. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to um, pass ordinance 49-22. Motion to adopt Ordinance 49-22 by Mr. Klingler. Second. Second by Ms. Feibel. Mr. McPeak. Ms. Lamke. Yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Mr. Klingler. Yes. Ms. Feibel. Yes. Ms. Todd. Mr. Marcelino. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Ordinance passes. Thank you. And thank you to all of you. Ah, hey, hey, save that mosquito. We need to test that. All right, let's move back to the administrative update, please. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, one one quick moment here. I was let, letting the directors know when we're back on that. Um, to give them a little bit of time to rejoin us, I'm going to ask Mr. Price if uh, he could uh, join next. Or sorry, join next. Sorry, start. Sure. You know what I'm talking about. Happy to. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the only thing I would just highlight in the report is, again, the Bexley Community Foundation Texas Hold'em fundraiser is this Friday at Jeffrey Mansion. Uh, starting at six with food. Thank you, Jimmy Johns, for their sponsorship and providing food for all the participants. And the uh, poker tournament will start at seven. Uh, there's more information at bexy.org forward slash poker. It will be a ton of fun. So if you got looking for something to do on Friday night, 
uh, and obviously raises money for a great cause and, and helping the community foundation. Other than that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Price. Oh, you're the parks. Did, did you guys know that? Yeah. It's uh, You're the Parks. Thanks, Mike, for the You're the Parks update. <laughs> Appreciate that. <clears throat> Are you, that's, Monique uh, asked a great question. Uh, is that the Year of the Parks logo? It is indeed. It was in the, uh, she thinks it's funny. She doesn't like the logo. <laughs> it was in the, uh, in the uh, last, last, I think our last council meeting, I had it highlighted in my mayor's update. Motion to adopt the logo. Uh, approved. Same sign. <laughs> it is unanimous. Actually, let me tell you, this is actually a funny story. So this logo, this is kind of blurry right here, but there was, we were looking for some marks that we could kind of put out there, have a logo and, and put on a t-shirt and that sort of thing. And we found one that we liked. It had, it was a lot, it was like this, but it had like a Ferris wheel and some other stuff. And so we reached out to the designer who's in Bosnia and worked with him. And uh, the, the, that, the detail in the bridge, which is books that Allen Creek bridge that, cross with the circle in the middle kind of diagonal across the circle middle is on the library and lots of other places throughout the city so you see that detail around and uh thought you guys would appreciate that customized nice. logo thank you thank you jen i thank you for appreciating that somebody does uh chief uh are you here there he is i am sir all right there you are We can hear you. Well, we could hear you. You're muted now. Oh, there we go. Know. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Any questions for the chief? Chief, anything you want to um, highlight in this? Uh, you know, one of the things that um, at the very top of the report highlights uh, much of what has been discussed since my arrival on the three year strategic plan along with creating some needed positions with the department, as well as the city. I'm very excited to announce that uh, the interviews were conducted today and three were selected to take on the new roles and lieutenants and we'll have much more to share uh, in a very public um, environment and specifically with city council. Thank you, Chief. Any yes, questions sir. for the all right. I have one. Right oh, wait, sorry, Jen. My uh, this is just a, a calendar confirmation. I, I seem to have on my calendar this Friday at 11 is the new recruit swearing in. Is that still happening? Um, I think that was probably a placeholder. That swearing okay. in is, is taking place. Um, it's a really a, a ceremonial piece that the city of Columbus, the police department does at their location. We are going to do something very formal with City Hall, and it's something the mayor and I think is going to be really kind of the uh, moving forward, uh, bringing that dynamic to City Council and then having promotions and swearing ins there and, and looking to do something on a larger scale, probably about the third week in February. Fantastic. Thanks so much for the update. Chief, would you yes, be willing to also give some uh, mosquito updates while you do the swearing in? <sighs> I, I am going to uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Mayor, and, and defer all calls. This is the year of the park, so mosquitoes will be important. Thank you for pointing out that it's the year of the parks, Chief. I really do appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> mosquitoes. No, the canine is actually going to be a parks liaison officer as part of the year of the park. <laughs> yes, we will make sure the dog harness has a appropriate logos. <laughs> thank you, Chief. Appreciate you. Have a good evening. Uh, Mr. Bayshore, Service Director. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm very well educated on mosquitoes now, so I can help the Chief. <laughs> but uh, I attached my report. I also have a, kind of a little bit of what the Service Department did, uh, kind of like a year-end report on the, on the back page. And don't really have anything to add, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Oh my God, Matt! We need you to save it for the Sorry, Andy. One second, you're back. We lost you for a second. Uh oh. 
<laughs> Sorry, Andy, you want to repeat what you were highlighting after you? Try so rudely interrupt. Is this watch out? Oh. Andy, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Am I coming okay. through? Okay. You're coming through. You were uh, you were starting to talk about Year of the Parks. Uh, yeah, Year of the Parks. Um, other than Year of the Parks, I attached uh, to the back page of my report just kind of a little synopsis of what the service department got into over the past uh, past year in 2022. Um, not everything we did, but just a little sample. Um, happy to answer any questions. I'm very ready for springtime. That's great, Andy. And I hope uh, <laughs> make sure to give that to Sam so that uh, he could put that on our annual report. And I believe Monique has a question about tonight's snow plowing activities. <laughs> It's actually not about that, but Andy, I had a quick question for you. I saw that you have completed the leaf pickup program. We have. Um, in case we have residents or neighbors who um, maybe quite didn't didn't make it to the to the curb, is there ever a chance in the winter when it's decent outside that or can they call you or are they kind of out of luck till further notice? I would suggest you know just bag them for Rumpke. Um Right. Okay. If they would call in the next week or so, uh, we could probably get them. Um, the problem is we're tearing down all the trucks um, and putting plows and solders on. I do have one truck left that still has a leaf box on. Um, so if, if I would get a call in the next week or so, we could take care of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Andy, did you get a uh, nap this afternoon? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> well, Andy, uh, good luck this evening and tomorrow. I know that we Amen. expect a little bit of snow. I know you guys are ready. So thank you for that. We are ready. All right. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate no it. Thank you. Mr. Hale. Thank you, Mr. Hale. Got some actuals. Hold on. Trying to get the video on. Yep, there it is. Yep. Got your um, final numbers for 2022 and the theme for 2022, which was excellent income tax continued. Um, or at least finalized, we ended up $1.8 million or, you know, almost $1.85 million over, over budget. And that translated to revenue being about $1.87 million over budget. Um, expenditures were under budget. Uh, let's see, what was it about $876,000. And so the bottom line was we ended up close to $1.7 million better than budget. I will highlight that income tax was so good, Mayor, that even though we revised the budget upward during the budgeting process, our budget for 2023 ended up 3% less than our actual for 2022. So at tax budget time, when we start looking at next year's budget, we should, we may have to take a look at that. Hopefully we have to take a look at that and revise it upwards. Um, although one never knows. Um, but that's about it. That's all the highlights I have. Any questions? <clears throat> yeah. So uh, question from Matt was if how much work from home impacted our income stream. I don't know that Feature we have an actual very hard to do that would be very hard to determine i'm i'm but, i would you know if i just wanted to guess it, i'd say it have to impact it some um because w i remember mayor when you put out the information i got quite a few phone calls about people asking about it so i know there was interest in that and there was some impact um to quantify that i have that'd be very difficult to do well, it's an important message for the uh, the legions of residents listening in that uh, if you are working from home, making sure that you're paying tax to Bexley as opposed to uh, your where your headquarters might be will save you money. So uh, most likely, depending on your tax situation, most likely will save you money, depending on the Correct. tax situation. It will if you work in Columbus and, and many of the other municipalities in Central Isle. Legions. Legions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hale. Any other questions for Beecher? You're good. Thanks, Beach. I'll field any mosquito questions you want to ask me. I feel like All an right. expert now. Calm down. Thanks, <laughs> Have a good All night, right. man. See Have you. a good evening. Um, so uh, real quickly, I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of things. First off, we did have a meeting regarding our 4th of July parade route. Um, and the recommendation that we're going to make 
is that we revert to the earlier parade route that goes down Mount Street as opposed to uh, further south at Astor. The shorter, shorter, it's still like one of the longest, the longest <laughs> parade in Central Ohio, I think. Um, is is the main reason for that just because it's uh you know it's, it is that longer route was pretty hard on uh parade uh participants or, or people in the parade and we plan on getting the word out to the community and and inviting anyone who wants to talk about it to come to a celebrations and events and meeting mm -hmm. in the next month or so so we really do think that it's it's for health reasons that we need to revert back to the parade route the way that it was um it's just really long remember we did it because we wanted people to be able to spread out during during covid um but uh other than that i have a, a couple like quite a lot in writing here some year of the parks updates um i do want to call out uh in, in remembrance joe ridgeway uh senior joe ridgeway uh lived on sherwood road passed away last week um he was not just our traffic engineer for many decades. He was also the Columbus uh, service director uh, for some time. And then his latest gig before he retired was at EP Ferris. And in fact, up until he, he was in his eighties and up until I think four years ago, he was still working at EP Ferris. So um, Joe has, was a great friend of Bexley and uh, put a lot of work and diligence into his time as our traffic engineer. So wanted to remember him wanted to uh, give a shout out to Pete Bricky, who retired uh, this la last week formally. Um, and I, th I might have accidentally uh, spilled the beans here with our <laughs> lieutenant promotions, but, uh, but uh, there you go. Um, pretend to act surprised uh, whenever Chief Lewis tells you. <laughs> um, and then save the date, the 10th uh, Jeffrey, the 10th Jeffrey Woods Festival. Mike, I think I'm right about this. I was doing some math. I think 2014 was our first year. Uh, there's very handsome gentlemen there at the festival last year. We will be uh, making some maple syrup, chopping some wood March 4th. Um, Mike has some pretty ambitious concepts about like, camping overnight and doing lots of maple syrup boiling and like doubling yield. Ooh. So good luck we're to just, all. Of we're us. just going to water it down more. <laughs> <laughs> Double the yield, just add some water. Shouldn't be problem. And that uh, I reiterated my goals. I uh, got a photo of Brew not wanting to have his photo taken at the M MLK Junior uh -huh. event at the library. So thanks to uh, Barb for putting that together. And more of this tomorrow, perhaps. And that concludes my update. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. I think we are now going to the consent agenda. Consent agenda. We have the meetings from January 10th, 2023 and resolution 11-22, confirming the mayor's appointments of members to the Bexley Community Improvement Corporation that was introduced by Ms. Robinson. Any comments or questions on the consent agenda? Comments or questions from the audience on the consent agenda? If not, I will move to adopt the consent agenda. Second. A second by Mr. Klingler. Mr. McPeak. Mr. Marcelino. Yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Ms. Saad. Ms. Feibel. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Klingler. Yes. Ms. Lamke. Yes. Consent agenda passes. All right. Well, there are no third or second readings, so we are moving on to first readings, which will then generate second and third reading, second readings next time, just so you know. So first of all, we have a first reading of Ordinance 1-23 to appropriate $61,924 to pay school revenue sharing based on 2021 payroll taxes collected from tenants of Bexley Gateway, introduced by Ms. Lamke. Thank you. As the attorney official mentioned, this is to appropriate those funds to revenue sharing to the school based on the 21 payroll taxes collected by the tenants of Bexley Gateway. Any questions? All right, then I assume we're moving on to or first reading of Ordinance 2 23 to appropriate $441,220 from the Road and Alley Fund and to pay for the uncompleted portion of the 2022 Drexel Avenue and Grandin Avenue improvement project introduced by Ms. Lamke. Thank you, Mayor. Do you want to briefly walk through 
this one? Uh, yeah. Yes, this what I'm about to say applies to the next one as well. And actually, Matt might be the person to, to walk you through it. But uh, these are OPWC projects that uh, have been awarded to the city, have been started. Uh, every year we have to pro appropriate remaining funds into that account in order to expend them. Um, we don't do carryovers uh, with this type of fund. I believe that synopsizes it. I think that sums it up okay. nicely. Yeah. Any questions from council? Okay, then we have first reading of ordinance 3-23 to establish a special fund designated the North Columbia and South Remington Road Improvements Fund to record all revenue and expenses associated with the North Columbia and South Remington Road project to appropriate $4,969,075 from this fund to pay for the cost of the project introduced by Ms. Lamke. Okay, the mayor covered mayor covered this one briefly as well. Any kind of this is actually wanna, a little bit different. You want to add something? Yeah, I was. Yeah, so the other one had already this that there was a special fund pre existing for the previous project. This is re encumbering it. This is setting up the special fund for the project that we have already authorized and uh, will be beginning this year. And in fact, the North Columbia uh, work will be for sure uh, happening this summer, some of it. Outstanding. Oh, Matt, you've got a question. Is that just roads or is that water, sewer? Water. Um, and what primarily water roads a little bit of sewer yeah. but the sewer will be um i believe any sewer work will be storm related for these particular projects okay okay, okay. moving on to first reading of ordinance 4-23 to amend section 262.02 c3 holiday holidays what the heck introduced by ms lamke some of you might remember that just recently we passed um, um, an ordinance uh, giving the mayor the ability to grant some additional time off. And because of some calendar uh, dates for, I believe, this year, uh, there were some tweaks that needed to be made. Mayor, do you want to walk through um, some of the minor changes to amend it? Yeah, so this is when we added that ability to, we basically codified the ability to give some additional time off before or after holidays uh, based upon just how we had traditionally operated. Um, thinking through it, we had occurred to us that, you know, anytime Christmas Eve was the business day and fell right between before Christmas, that was given, given uh, people were given that time off uh, within City Hall and the rec department. And um, it occurred to us that that was the case because it was and then we had christmas fall on a sunday and it, it you know then occurred to us that wait a second mm -hmm. when christmas falls on a you know certain days like a monday or a sunday or uh, new year's is the same way um it's really not traditionally that we would give a full extra day before just because we're that cheap and chintzy so um what would be more typical was for example we would have given a hot half day on friday which we had already told staff was happening everyone is happy as clams and then someone pointed out uh, the ordinance uh, that we had just passed. Somebody read the ordinance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so um, we've edited this to re reflect. Again, we're trying to just reflect what his, is an historic norm and fair to our employees, uh, provides a little bit more time off. So there's a little bit of a tweak to Section F, and we're eliminating the Christmas Eve and the New Year's Eve as was granted holidays because just because of that kind of variation from year to year. Any comments or questions on this? All right. All right, moving on to first reading of resolution 1-23 to amend the Jeffrey Mansion alcohol policy framework introduced by Ms. Saad. I will turn it to Ms. Feibel. Yeah, well, I'm really I'm really excited about this ordinance. I think that um, we were so thrilled to have the new space opened um, right after COVID. Um, and as per always, the rec department tiptoed their way into um, the Jeffrey Mansion alcohol uh, framework um, in a very, very conservative way. And I very much like, again, like the rec department, they did a great job doing that. And things have been very successful. And but there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of days that they could potentially um, open that the, the space up to other individuals to be able to enjoy it. 
And um, that's what this ordinance really is about. It's also going to talk a little bit to us about um, security and how we might tweak that a little bit. Um, please know that information has been sent out to the neighbors who qualify. In fact, I know I received mine um, yesterday. Um, so uh, we um, we know that that Jessica's not here, and I know that she um, had uh, worked really hard with Mike and the board and the rec department, and she, it, it's her hope that you all will take a deep dive into this yourselves over the next two weeks and, you know, bundle up your questions and maybe even throw them to Mike beforehand if you have the opportunity to, so that he comes here um, in two weeks. You're going to come and you're going to give us kind of more of a, a formal conversation about it and we can ask our questions then. So, um, any comments or questions, Mr. Marcelino? Yeah, um, Mike, would you mind potentially sharing the map that she sent to Jessica and I um, in regards to the properties that are encompassed by the 500 feet there? I just thought it was really helpful so that way we can look at it a little bit early and ask any questions that we may have. I'll be happy to do that. Thanks. Are there comments or questions? Yeah. All right. Uh, do we have any action on tabled ordinances? All right, I think then we can move to uh, committee reports and we'll start with Mr. Miller, who's had a busy tonight. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, just want to update, uh, the mayor and I have met a couple of times to start strategizing um, to formulate the land strategy use committee 2.0 refresher. So look for um, coming news for that. So I have Ben, do you have anything to add to that? You always do. So that was excellent. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> any uh any questions for Mr. Klingler or the mayor? All right. Uh Ms. Saad is not here, but I think uh Mr. Marcelino is reporting for her. I am doing my best to fill in for Ms. Saad today. I would like everybody to take a moment and mark their calendar for April 22nd, 2023. What is that? That's the Bexley Education Foundation's Bravo. Oh, this year, we have some news. We've moved to a new location. Oh, what? It will be held at the historic Valley Dale Ballroom. Oh, now, some of you may say, why is that historic? Well, it was added to the National Registry of Historical Places on December 17th, 1982. So it's been historic for a long time, and we now have the pleasure of holding the Bravo Bexley Education Foundation event there this year. Uh, just for those that aren't familiar, it's only about 11 minutes from the Cassingham, um, uh, 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 I'd say, area, so the Cassingham School. So if you are in North Bexley, make it about eight minutes, and if you're in South, make it about 14. But either way, make sure that you get there responsibly and maybe call an Uber if you're having too much fun. Looking By at you, way, There was one there. They, they did one there about... 20 years ago. So that's the first time. Mr. Well, Marcelino well, with, the, with the Waze report we are not, there. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your interruption, Mr. Mayor, but we're not done with the presentation. Thank you. Harder, harder. You know, there was a discuss earlier, that's the perception earlier about this Friday, January 26th. There's going to be a Texas Hold'em event taking place at a uh, the Jeffrey Mansion, and that'll be uh, at 7 p.m. So I encourage you all to go out and have a great time, win some money, uh, raise some money for the Bexley Community Foundation. It's January 27th. January 27th, 27th yes, indeed. So uh, please be there. And that is all for that report that uh, I tried to fill in for. Wow. Yes. Well done. Thank you. Why are you process reports so much better than your own? I know. Where was his question actually recognized, President? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we can ignore him. Yeah, I I, I will say that I think you've done Jessica very proud tonight, or Sam, uh, Ms. Feibel. All right. Well, whenever I don't have a um, report, Sam gets a little upset about it. So, Sam, this this is for you. Okay, specifically to you. Okay, Sam, say no to bags when you go shopping. Okay. 
a plastic bag is used for an average of 12 minutes, but will remain in the environment for A, 100 years, B, 500 years, C, 1,000 years. All of the above. That is, wow. I, well, that could be an option theoretically, but I would guess about 100. Mark is right. Oh. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> um, Tell, tell, tell me, Sam, what percentage of energy is used during a washing machine's cleaning cycle just for heating the water? 12%. 90%. Wow. Wash with cold. Okay. Recycling one can, one aluminum can can save enough energy to run one TV, two TVs, Three TVs, all of the above. I'm I'm undershooting, so I'm going to say all of the above. You are right. Wow. All of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Great news, everyone. We had less trash landfilled in 2022 than we have had since 2009. Wow. Hooray, hooray. And I want to let you know that um, your ESAC, we've had a meeting this week. They are really getting ready to have all kinds of great goals that they want to wrap their heads around as well as the um, the uh, tree and public garden and, and a lot of their goals overlap, which is really, really very exciting. And I think one of the most exciting goals that, that they have, um, at least the uh, tree and garden is they really want to do everything they can to increase our canopy. Um, because that it, it helps in so many ways to be able to increase the canopy. I'll bring you more next time on that one, Sam. Um, so the end of my report. Ms. Lamke, and there better be music with yours too. <laughs> I can't follow those last two reports. <laughs> no report. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to Mr. Marcelino. No report. No re <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Robinson, I know there's music with your report. Uh, it's music in my heart always. <laughs> she can um, sing it. <laughs> please, you guys, you will get an email from me. I'm just confirming the location, but please remember, and for those of you who are interested in attending on February the 15th, the day after Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. we will have our strategic planning meeting from nine to noon, most likely at the, the cottage. Um, and, um, I'm working on getting some breakfast catered at which time I will let you know what that is and when breakfast will be served, but likely 8 30, 8 45, get there early, get some breakfast and then we'll, I'm happy to bring the agenda. The, bread. The, um, the mayor and I have been working on putting together the document. I do have it. I will be forwarding that you can add to it. Um, you can add comments, you can put your names on things that interest you, but we're going to get that circulated beforehand. So we have plenty of time to know what, what kinds of things we'll be addressing at that meeting. And that is it. And don't be surprised She's if I distribute some half price Valentine's Day candy. Uh, to listen, okay. That is totally Was that fine. nine, Ms. Robinson? Uh, yes, yeah, starts at nine. Breakfast will likely be served a little bit before for those who want to okay. get there early. Oh, three to six. And I don't want to hear anything from anybody anymore. Oh, AM or PM, you choose. <laughs> at this time, we open up the floor to public comments. All right. Yes. No, that'll be on the 27th here this Friday at uh, 7 p.m. At uh, Jeff and yes for uh, yeah Texas Hold'em. Oh no, not the Texas. Oh, the Bravo the. No, the report uh, about the policy. Oh, that was uh, your. That was the next city council meeting. So that will be February seventh. Yeah. Yep. At uh, uh, this time, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion is adjourned by Mr. Klingler. Second. Second by Ms. Robinson. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Good night, everybody. Good night.